And the reason for kind of pointing to that is that I do think that there's a lot of folks who work in the field of admissions who've not either worked on the college counseling side or the, the college admissions office side. And so the information that I'm sharing with you is colored not just by my academic experience, but also by my direct observations of how system, students made it through the systems, how much variation can exist between schools and the way that they're evaluating students. Um, and so what I did want to start off first is to talk just a little bit about the different features that a college is going to be looking at uh, as they evaluate your application. Um, next slide. And essentially, there are a number of different features that are both within your control and outside of your control that are going to affect your candidacy within uh, the admissions office. And I would say that the first and, and by far the most important is going to be academic factors. Um, if you have C's on your transcript, if you have a school that <laughs> offers 32 different AP classes and you haven't taken a single one, there's really not much you can do to change your level of competitiveness at, at some of the top most selective schools in the United States. So um, when I talk about academic factors, that's going to include things like your overall GPA. Uh, some schools are very major specific, and so your GPA within courses relevant to your major might be more important. Um, how difficult the courses are, particularly as they uh, correlate to the types of, of things you might want to do in college. And then I would say that the, the final piece is your test score. And there are a number of schools that have become test optional either temporarily um, or permanently as a result of the pandemic. But at the end of the day, having a very strong test score is always going to be better than not having one at all. The next piece, and I think is, is almost equally important, is your extracurricular profile. The things that you're involved in outside of the classroom, what uh, are you engaged in in terms of academic pursuits uh, outside of school, uh, sports, athletics, um, what you may be doing in terms of an instrument, uh, different organizational commitments and leadership. These are incredibly important because when you are at a university, the United States system is quite different in that they expect you to be a resident who's gonna be engaging in multiple arenas uh, throughout your, your career at that school. And so uh, they want to be looking for students that will be able to carry on the mantle of many of the clubs and organizations um, that have been existing uh, and, and ensure that their future is continued. The main message that I take away from this is that simply being good isn't good enough. When you're looking at the overall pool of students, there's simply a, an incredible number of students with strong test scores, good GPAs and extracurricular activities. And it takes a lot more these days for you to really stand out at some of the most selective schools in the United States. Next slide. So what I've done is I've kind of pulled together some profiles of students I've worked with that have been admitted to, to really strong universities uh, over the last couple of years. Um, and so this first young man is, is a young man from the, the Boston metropolitan area. He had a solid SAT score, but it's clearly not perfect. You can see that he had seven AP classes, uh, which is great. And when you look at his awards and activities, this is where the student really started to shine. He's clearly interested in math and science, and you're seeing that reflected at a very high level in his activities activities. So he won an ICEF grand award at, um, at the ICEF International Science and Engineering Fair. He was an STS semifinalist also from that research. He was a five-time qualifier for Amy. He participated in MIT and the Center for Educational Excellence's uh, Research Science Institute, RSI. And then if you look at his math curriculum, that number of seven APs isn't sort of incredible when you're seeing many students taking anywhere from 12 to 15 of them. Um, but you do see See that his math uh, courses in particular are incredibly advanced and he's probably four levels above uh, APBC calculus. Um, next slide. This next young woman uh, is from the Houston uh, area. She has a very strong SAT, very strong AP uh, course load and a number of really strong scores. Um, and then when you look at her activities, it's a little bit more diverse, um, but she's clearly working many of her activities towards a particular goal. So she's clearly interested in computer science. She's achieving musical gold, which there's only around 150 women per year that are achieving at gold level or higher. Um, she was a girl who posed, uh, girls who code mentor. She participated in a writing program considered to be one of the best writing programs. Um, but I think what really stands out is that she has a passion for bringing coding and computer science to underrepresented groups. And so she founded her own nonprofit organization that was operating throughout high school um, that focused on teaching robotics and coding to young women on Native American reservations throughout the Southwest of the United States. Um, next slide. 
And then this uh, young man is from the New York metropolitan area. And you can kind of take a look at his profile is still different. Strong SAT, strong AP courses, because I think those are prerequisite to even be considered um, for admission at many of these universities. But he's kind of uh, opted for a different path of specialization. So he was conducting for a few years in high school research um, in political science with uh, a faculty member at a nearby university. And that research was recognized and published in the Concord Review, um, a well known journal for high school research. He participated in probably the most selective program for high school students in the United States, and that is TASC, the Telluride Association summer program, which simulates a college experience for a small handful of students at Cornell and at the University of Michigan. Um, he was taking extra classes in the summer in philosophy, and he was very politically organized and, and involved in his, his high school. And so he organized a number of rallies against gun violence in his community. Uh, next slide. And so if you're thinking about um, essentially what this reveals about these students, I think the common thread is that they all started this process early. Um, when students are achieving at that level of success, the level of success to, to, to really stand out in these highly competitive processes at the level that they did, they began many of these processes in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I think that first student who was admitted, uh, ultimately decided to go to Harvard, but was admitted to Harvard and MIT, ultimately was a five-time Amy qualifier. That means he was qualifying for the Amy in seventh grade, eighth grade, and ninth grade. And so he was able to kind of really build on that success throughout his high school year. Uh, next slide. So one of the things that I really wanted to kind of talk with you all today about is starting to think about what ways in which you can begin to cultivate um, excellence and really start laying solid foundations in middle school that will enable you to really take off when you get to the high school. And then the final piece that I really want to touch on is academic research, because I think that this is something that is underappreciated and, and, and I think a little bit misunderstood. When I worked at MIT, I would say probably 50% of the students who applied for admission uh, had conducted or, or purported to have conducted some sort of research opportunity. However, I would say that the majority of them didn't even fully understand what research was. Um, and so I think the more you can sort of uh, immerse yourself in research, what that perspective entails, what experimentation entails, um, and to build sort of the, the quantitative and other skills, those hard and soft skills that are necessary to conduct research, the earlier you can begin to do it legitimately and actually perhaps achieve some pretty impressive results. Um, so I'd say that the majority of students who are scoring at incredibly high levels at, at things like ICEF and STS, they've been conducting research or preparing to conduct research from before high school even began. Uh, or they attend high school programs that have really dedicated advanced programs that are step walking them through every step of the process, which is often very difficult to do and not necessarily accessible to everyone. Next slide. So when you think about what research is, you can think a little bit about how it is both a noun and a verb. If you think about the noun, it's the sy uh, systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts or reach new conclusions. Or you can think about it as a verb, which simply means to investigate systematically. And I think for me, what that sort of conjures is a number of different qualities and skills. Uh, next slide. So if you think about students who are participating in research, essentially what they are doing is they're asking questions that no one knows the answers to. Either they're trying to make new connections and uncover new truths or theories in something like history, or they're asking a question about how the inner machinery of a human cell actually works, uh, and really then designing an experiment or a process to find the results uh, to that question. And so I like to think that this is an incredibly creative process. If you are essentially asking questions that no one knows the answer to, it requires you to be creative. It requires you to walk into the unknown. And that's a powerful skill that will help people for the rest of their life. I think it helps a lot with problem solving. I think anyone who conducts research in any field across the board uh, has an understanding that, um, that has an understanding that uh, science research and research in general rarely goes according to plan, and that you fail a lot. It teaches children resilience, but it also teaches them how to actually analyze those failures and improve the process for the future. And I think the final piece is that it involves critical 
critical thinking. Uh, I would say that asking questions no one knows the answer to is difficult um, because it requires intense critical thinking. And that's not something that students are naturally good at. It's not something we as humans are naturally good at. Uh, I think it is, is in fact something that we really need to train uh, and, and increase the number of opportunities that we are sort of asked to do these difficult things. Um, and so that critical thinking skill is, is a natural byproduct of doing research frequently and doing research well. And there's a quote from uh, Stanford University's main website that I really love. And essentially what they say is that each piece in an application is part of an integrated and comprehensive whole. We seek to understand uh, how you as a whole person would grow, contribute and thrive at Stanford and how Stanford in turn would be changed by you. And I think you can see in that quote that they're really emphasizing uh, that there's a lot more to the admissions process for them than just your achievements. They're not asking uh, how you would, um, be an all-star in the classroom, how you would have a perfect GPA. They're trying to understand how you as a person would grow through Stanford's resources, but how you in turn would shape and impact the community as well. Um, and I think one, one feature of how they're sort of doing this is what I like to call non-cognitive qualities. And essentially, I think that there's a tendency to think that elite admissions offices are kind of making random decisions. Um, and sometimes it does feel that way, but they've also consulted with a number of education researchers, sociologists, and psychologists to really identify what are the qualities that are the most correlated with success in the classroom and success as human beings. Um, and so non-cognitives are essentially skills or qualities that we are honing and developing throughout our entire lives that are, are strongly linked to success. Um, and in fact, may actually predict success much better than things like innate talent or even intelligence. Next slide. And so uh, there was a report that came out recently um, from the Harvard Graduate School of Education that had done an extensive interview of admissions officers, had sat in and observed their processes, and had analyzed their rubrics that they used to kind of assess a student's um, qualifications for admissions. And what they found is that there are eight uh, highly common um, non-cognitive qualities that exist across the spectrum for students um, that, that sort of these colleges are really putting a lot of emphasis on in the admissions process. And I think some of them will be fairly obvious to you. Almost every college says things like, we're looking for curious students. Um, we want students that are delighted by the process of learning, that their eyes light up when they learn something new, uh, or folks that have the ability to work with a project until they, they really get it to the end, even though it may be challenging, they delight in that kind of problem solving. Um, that curiosity is something that I think is highly correlated with student success. Um, and it's also one thing that I think colleges are very aware of that many high school students do not necessarily innately possess. I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of parents that push their students to do certain things to achieve at a high level. And those students never really discover that internal motivation, that love of learning that will motivate them after uh, they graduate from high school. And then they're in a college campus where they're on their own, they're picking their classes, they're responsible for their performance. And I think many colleges have seen that those students can really crash and burn um, when they arrive on their highly rigorous and competitive campuses. Another that I think is really important is an idea of self-control. Um, self-control, I think, is, is a synonym really for discipline, um, but it's the idea to really set goals and to stick with them. Um, another that I think is incredibly important is, is a sort of a buzzy word that has somewhat lost its, its meaning because you've probably read lots of articles about this, and that's grit. But essentially, at the end of the day, when you think about what grit is, is it's resilience. It is a student's ability to maintain enthusiasm and a positive attitude, even when they're encountering adversity or their plans uh, are not sort of coming to fruition in the way that they had intended. Um, and in fact, those two qualities I just mentioned, self-control um, and, and grit, are actually the two most significant predictors of a person's success later in life um, than any other quality. Uh, next slide. Um, and then the one that I did want to sort of just uh, quickly mention before moving on to this, sorry, Rebecca, <laughs> um, is, is just perspective taking. And that one is, is one that I actually just forgot to mention, um, but is, is one that is increasingly important because I think 
these elite universities really pride themselves on having incredibly diverse communities. Um, when I worked at MIT, our favorite line was that we had um, 50 states, 12 sovereign nations, four US territories, 126 countries, 40% Asian students, 20% Hispanic students, 15% Black students, 3% Native students, students from all walks of life, all academic majors. And that diversity can come with friction. When you're interacting with people who are very different from yourself and see the world in a different kind of way, I think some tension and some conflict can be natural. And so colleges are looking for students that have the ability to step into the shoes, learn about the experiences, and perceive the world from the perspective of others who are quite different from themselves. And that's a skill that I think uh, is actually quite easy to begin honing and developing these. The next piece is perhaps the most important out of anything I've mentioned before, and that is to use your summers effectively. I think there's a lot of students who kind of don't really use their summers for much early on in high school and then later on are being denied from a lot of the opportunities they would like to do because they don't have the foundation to build on top of. So I think summers are an incredible opportunity for you to leapfrog academic classes um, in, in areas that are important to you. There are also opportunities for you to devote up to 10 weeks um, free on a project that, that you can customize, that you can make an impact on, that you can get involved in a way that would be impossible for you to do during the school year. And I think to give you a really good example of this, I worked with a student um, who's applying to colleges this year, and he has an amazing academic profile because in eighth grade, we determined that he really liked business and economics. And so what we did is we enrolled him in a program over the summer where he got to learn a little bit about microeconomics. He decided he loved the subject, used his freshman year to self-study micro and macro, got fives on both of the AP exams, um, was also taking advanced math classes and had completed basic calculus by the end of his freshman year. And so he took econometrics and um, did a number of programs, um, including an internship doing market research um, at a consulting company. Uh, that summer. Then the next summer, he took labor economics and did a research internship. And then that summer after that, he was able to actually secure two incredibly impressive research internships simultaneously, one at MIT, working with a really well-known economist, and the other with an award Nobel Prize winning faculty member at a nearby university. Um, and that faculty member was so impressed, he asked if he could write a letter of recommendation on his behalf and asked him to stay on as a research intern, um, for which he's doing an independent study now uh, through the fall of his senior year of high school. And so when you're building on that in a foundational way, you're able to really enhance and amplify what you can accomplish by the end of 